I'm going to share a very long story in a very short few minutes. That your head's a lousy office. Now, uh, when I was six months old, um, I was a pretty serious kid. <laughs> and it took me 37 years, lots of places I went, things I learned, things I experienced, to get to a place where I could get back to what I really loved and enjoyed as I grew up, which was clear space, being able to be spontaneous, follow my intuitive hunches, freedom, peace of mind, clarity. As my life got more complex and more subtle, it's pretty hard to kind of keep that going. So I put together a lot of pieces there, and so the first uh, 37 years, 36 years, took me to get to the place where I started to build a methodology and recognize that. And then the last half of my life, uh, yes, I am 72, if Joseph's worried about his ending soon, I'm going, <laughs> I better speak fast, right? <laughs> so the last half of my life, I spent researching, testing out, developing a methodology, and then spending thousands of hours, quite literally, one-on-one, -on -one, desk side, with some of the best, brightest, and busiest people on the planet, applying this stuff and watching what happens when you apply this methodology. So let me back up a little bit and give you, especially those of you who are not necessarily familiar with GTD or the Getting Things Done methodology, as I describe in the book. Uh, let me ask you a question. How are things in your head office? <laughs> Where is your head office? Most of the people on the planet, this is their head office, and it's a crappy office. Most of the people are trying to manage, remembering, reminding, prioritizing, and understanding relationships between multiple things in here. And it sucks. It doesn't work that way. Your brain did not evolve to remember, remind, prioritize, or understand relationships between things. Your brain evolved to keep you alive on the savannah and in the desert and, and the jungle by looking at current reality using long-term history and pattern recognition. Oh, that's probably a tiger. A thunderstorm's coming. Hmm, baby's crying. Yeah, and you're doing that right now, by the way. And very few comp computers can't even come close to what you're doing right now. And yet you go to the store to buy lemons, and you come back with six things and no lemons. What happened? <laughs> you tried to use this as your office. And new cognitive science has now developed, has now proven how many things you could hold just in this office and manage remembering, reminding, prioritizing, and appropriate relationships between them. Guess how many things before you start to sub-optimize your optimal, your cognitive function? They used to think it was seven, plus or minus two, but that was before email and, and texting, I guess, and Facebook and Twitter. Four, that's it. You add any more than that, you'll be driven by latest and loudest. So I uncovered this principle on the street, working with people and working with myself, you know, 30 plus years ago. And now the cognitive scientists have basically validated your heads for having ideas. It's brilliant at that, but it's absolutely terrible for trying to hang on to them. Do any of you have anything on your mind, by the way? Yeah, well, the problem is, if you just lived, if you lived in the jungle, four things is probably enough. Yeah, we live in a jungle. It's just this, right? Give me 10 minutes of when you're back at the ranch. What are you, you're going to deal with three emails. You just, oh, God, those are ugly. I don't want to have to deal with those things. Oh, my God. And then your boss dumps the problem on you you're going to have to solve. And then you get a text from your daughter. And then a text from your mother. My, my mother-in-law is 92, and she FaceTimes my wife at the weirdest times. <laughs> now, a lot of people would say, okay, well... Is there some way out and through this jungle? Uh, yeah, and it's, I'd steal it from the martial arts. If you had mind like water, that is, you had the ability to not over or under react, but be totally present with where, is, where things are and stay clear. Yeah, that's the way to get through it. Mind like water. See, if you're taking one meeting to the next psychologically, or you're taking home to work in your mind, or work to home in your mind, that's not mind like water. You, know, you need to be fully present, you need to be there. Now, people would say, God, if I had more time, David, I could relax and I could get there. All right. It's a good thing you only have 24 hours. Right, if you had 26, you'd have two more of what you got. Right, you don't need time. By the way, how much time does it take to have a good idea? Zero. How much time does it take to be strategic? Zero. How much time does it take to be innovative, creative? How much time does it take to be present and loving with your kids? 
Zero. Those do not require time. They do require something. What's that? Room. You need room in there. If you are hung up about that last meeting, that last problem, that last thing, it's hard to be creative, innovative, strategic, loving, present. And yet most people would say those are pretty golden goodies. And you need room. By the way, over these years, with the thousands of people who've implemented this methodology, I guarantee you, everyone who does any of these behaviors actually creates more space. How they use it is as u- unique as the person. Right? What if you had nothing pulling on your mind right now, folks? Absolutely zero pulling on tabula rasa. It was totally free and clear. Well, how would you use that? A lot of people use it to just be more creative. A lot of people use it to be able to see a longer horizon instead of down in the weeds and wrapped around the axle so tight. A lot of people use it simply to be present. You know, some of the most dramatic testimonials we've had over the years are uh, parents who say, oh my God, for the first time in my life, I watch my daughter play soccer without my smartphone. And if that's a core value to you, that's huge. Now, that's a healthy place to be to begin with, but it's also highly functional. This is not some namsy pamsy meditative sitting on the hill kind of stuff. If you're actually present, that's required if you're going to engage in high-performance behavior. If you want to be a knowledge worker ninja, <laughs> right? Relaxed, focused, in control, clear, ready for anything. What the military calls situational awareness. Best state to hit a golf ball from, best state to fire somebody from, best state to have a crucial conversation from, best state to cook spaghetti from. <laughs> this is the best state to be in if you want to be optimal in terms of how you, how you work, how you behave, how you, and what you see. The problem is when people are using their head as their office, that a whole lot of stuff gets wrapped around that that then keeps them from being able to be available to that. The thousands of hours I spent one-on-one with people actually having them empty their head, guess how long it takes for the typical mid to senior level, level professional just to get all the stuff that has their attention out of their head. Not organize it, not prioritize it, not do anything, just identify the stuff that's pulling on their psyche, one to six hours. I had to take 16 hours for a guy one time. Finally, I just told him, hey, you get the idea. <laughs> he wasn't stupid, he was the chairman of two companies. And a lot of people say, well, gee, David, yeah, that's information overload. No, it's not. If information overload was the problem, you walk into a library and die. <laughs> as soon as you connected the web, you'd blow up. As a matter of fact, one of the most information-rich places in the world is one of the most relaxing places in the world. You know, if you really wanted to get stressed out, Get rid of all that. Spend your day in this room. Sensory deprivation is how you go nuts. So it's not information overload. It is an overload of something. What's that? It's an overload of potentially relevant input that you haven't clarified or managed the relevance or have appropriate engagement with yet. See, if you're out in the jungle, I mean, snakes and berries and thunderstorms and babies crying, yeah, that's the four things you can handle. The problem is every single one of those emails that's mounting up while you're sitting here has a potential snake or berry or thunderstorm inside it. Right? You don't care about the people's, other people's emails sitting at your table. It's the stuff that's landed into your ecosystem about what you still need to identify it, capture it, organize it, manage it, figure out some way to appropriately engage with it. So I was teaching how to kind of do this years ago. I was in in Boston, and I had a psychologist, or a cognitive scientist, actually. She she came up, she says, David, you know what what you're talking about? You know what you're doing? You know what this is? I said, no, no, what is this? She said, distributed cognition. I said, you mean write it down? She said, well, that's another way to say it. (laughs) You know what she called this? Cognitive artifact. (laughs) Oh, that's some cocktail party conversation. But this was back in the early 90s, and since then there's been a whole science that started to understand what we can do and what we can't do in terms of our cognitive capabilities, in terms of what what that's all about. And what they've discovered is that your brain really functions extremely well in the present, looking at things in an external environment. It does that brilliantly, very, very good. 
So it depends on sort of something being out there. And then your brain can, how many of you have ever, ever gone up to a whiteboard or an easel pad and taken notes during a meeting? Then you understand that you needed to have those out of your head so that you, your brain didn't have to keep remembering them. Right? And that automatically improved you know, your conditions in that situation and your intelligence and your creativity. So again, we've all sort of experienced this, but understanding this now is a science. The problem is, is most people have that stuff banging around in their head that has no sense of past or future, and most people are walking around thinking about how they should be thinking about what they should be thinking about, how they should be thinking about what they need to be thinking about, how they ought to be thinking about what they ought to be thinking about, and they never actually finish the exercise. They just walk around in angst. Okay, let's get some quotes from some people smarter than me. A guy named Alfred North Whitehead, and I, I won't, you don't have to, you can scan this stuff, but basically I'll paraphrase it. Basically he says, look guys, civilization advances by taking smart things and automating them so that you don't have to use your mind to keep thinking about it. It happens automatically, right? And thinking is a tough thing to do, and you need to save that like a cavalry charge. You need the right energy to be able to think, and you need to focus when you think. Yeah, no kidding. Let's go a little closer to time. Any of you read uh, Atul Gawande's book, <clears throat> The Checklist Manifesto? By the way, he's a GTDer. Uh, you know, I, I called him, I wanted to do a podcast with him, and he was embarrassed. He said, David, I don't, I don't feel like I'm doing it really well yet. <laughs> but this guy is brilliant. You know, he's the surgeon that's, you know, basically written that. And, you know, a, a basic idea is the checklist or give your brain a rest. How many of you use some sort of a checklist anytime? Okay, yeah, but if you have a calendar, that's a checklist. You know, all that stuff sort of externalized there. But he says an interesting thing. They catch mental flaws, flaws of memory and attention and thoroughness, and because they do, they raise wide, unexpected possibilities. When my wife and I actually have a list of stuff to buy at the market, it gives us freedom to buy stuff not on the list. <laughs> hey, if you didn't have the list, you've got to keep trying to remember the list. Whoa, whoa wait a minute. We could do that. That's cool. Another GTD, or he came across my book as he was almost finishing his, Daniel Levitin, head of cognitive science at McGill University. Right? Uh, you can still see this in the airport bookstores. Uh, he said uh, he was almost finished with his book before he read mine, and he freaked out, ran to his publisher, and said, oh my God, do I even need to write mine? <laughs> Believe me, I'm glad he did, because there's a lot of really cool stuff in there. But, you know, he basically popularized the idea, look, guys, you need the external brain. You know, your internal one sucks, basically. Another very smart guy. Uh, this guy is a psychiatrist and a physician and a major researcher in cognitive science, and he spent uh, two or three years studying 650-plus research projects about how the brain works and how it doesn't work, and curated all that into this fabulous book. Uh, and that's a lot about how the mind doesn't work. He's got a big rant out there, by the way, about social media and how the kids are getting addicted to it and what that's happening to their brain. He's not anti-technology, but be, it's a cautionary tale, believe me. Great book, tons of stuff, tons of information in there. And, you know, come on. This is common sense, but there's the big result of all of that. Called, look, if you want to be present, you've got to do what you need to do to stop that noise and that static. And he's got lots of great data about that. I had lunch with him. He's a, he's a Belgian. I had lunch with him, uh, and he said, fascinating, because he just then read my book, and he said he'd spent 30 years in academia and research coming up with the same conclusions I'd spent 30 years on the street coming up with. So he was very fascinated by that. So we're good buddies now. <laughs> These guys flew out to meet me when I was living in California uh, because they were wondering how come I had come up with all of this. Roy Baumeister is one of, probably one of the premier cognitive researchers, cognitive science researchers, at the University of Florida. You know, written many, many books, written tons of papers about all of this. And if you've heard decision fatigue, that's where this comes from. In other words, your brain only has a limit to how many things it can decide and, and be doing before you, you, you burn it out. It's like a muscle. And they were fascinated how I'd come up with all this, this stuff that they'd also come up with in their research. And a very interesting thing there was that Roy, in a lot of his research, found that your mind actually, you don't have to finish the stuff that has your attention, but what you do have to do is park the re results in some place you trust you'll see at the right time. 
and then the unconscious lets it go. Another vote for the external brain. And these two guys showed up, and they went, by the way, David, we read your book, we got all inspired, and they spent a long time creating a huge research project on the science behind why getting things done really works. And it took me five times to read their 26-page white paper. By the way, this paper was peer-reviewed uh, you know, in the Journal of Long-Range uh, Planning, I believe. And these guys are brilliant. They really are. And it took a long time for me to really understand sort of everything that they were saying, but just some of the basics of that <clears throat> is that basically, if you try to keep track of those stuff, it just overburdens the brain. And this is just research that they, that they found and tested a whole bunch of things in that way. And <clears throat> the brain, uh, this is fascinating to me, the brain's an intrinsically active medium where patterns are always in flux. As such, it is poor at keeping track of unchanging details. The passive media of paper or hard disk are much better at storing information in an invariant way so that you can be sure that what comes out is exactly what you put in. I know to some degree this is a big duh, but very few people are really doing this. I mean truly, so that there's nothing on your mind. By the way, having nothing on your mind, even when you're buried with stuff to do, is a very delicious place to operate from. Uh, by the way, the fascinating thing about this is Francis Heilich, uh, I'm living in Amsterdam now, so I'm starting to learn a little Dutch. Uh, his expertise was insect behavior. Have any of you ever had, seen two ants in your kitchen and in an hour you had a thousand? How does that happen? Well, what happens is uh, worker ants are programmed to go find food. If they find food, they're programmed to take it back to the nest. But if they find food and they're taking it back to the nest, they're dropping pheromones all along the way. So the next ant shows up and goes, mm, pheromones, ooh, pheromone trail, yo. You know. <laughs> and they're out there getting food, dropping more pheromones as they come back. Food runs out, pheromones run out. Ants are no longer there, right? How does that happen? Well, they're dumb, they have no memory, but they are highly effective. Why? Because they've been programmed to do a certain kind of behavior when they run across a certain thing. Okay, how many of you have ever taken work home that you had to bring back to work the next day? You had to review it, you had to you know, look at it or edit it or something, but mission critical, you do not forget this. Oh my God, what strategies did you employ the night before so that you could be sure you would not forget the stuff in the morning? Ever put anything in front of your door? For this, you got a college degree, huh? Hmm. Hey, what a sophisticated piece of self-management technology you have installed in your life. Actually, it is. You know why? The night before, some part of you was smart, sophisticated, and savvy enough to realize that whoever was going to try to go through the door in the morning may barely be conscious of it all. What the hell is this? Oh, God, I've got to take that with me. Oh, right. What a class act. Dumb, no memory, but highly effective. See, it's the really smart, intelligent people that know you're only smart and intelligent at random moments. <laughs> and when you are smart and intelligent, you come up with smart, intelligent things that you park the results of that in places that you can be kind of thick and dumb and you do smart stuff. Not kidding. Not kidding. Okay, there is a methodology where you could... Ha See, the trick is to get what do you need to put in front of the door, the door of your mind, not just the door of your house. What do you need to say? How many of you have looked at your calendar in the last three days? Ah, you put something in front of your door, right, that helped you locate in space and time. So you're already doing these behaviors. You just may not be that conscious of why those work. And when you start to work them, you can do them, you know, even much better. So there is a methodology to apply that actually gets this done, right? The five steps, the knowledge worker ninja, <laughs> right? First of all, you need to identify the stuff that has your attention. You need to make some decisions about what it means. You need to park the results in a trusted place that you review and step back and reflect on on a regular basis so that you engage with trust. This is how you got your kitchen under control when you found it out of control. You identified the stuff that was not on cruise control. You decided what it means, dirty dish, clean dish, spice, whatever. You organized based upon the thinking there. You stepped back, reflected on the whole thing, went to the fridge, pulled up butter and melted. That's how you get your kitchen under control, it's how you get your company under control, it's how you get your consciousness under control. So these, these steps are very real steps, but you're not born doing them. You need to 
capture what has your attention. You need to clarify what you're going to do about it, if anything, outcomes and actions involved. You need to park the results in some sort of a situational context that you'll see the, things, the, the stuff that people to call when you need to call them, stuff to talk to your life partner about when they're in front of you. You need to see those situationally. Once you do that, you need to then step back and take a look at the larger gestalt so that you're making trusted decisions about what you do. And then you keep doing that as habitual behaviors. Is this making sense? It just advanced common sense, but very few people have really, really done this. But I guarantee you, folks, that if you really do this, if you really start to implement this distributed cognition set of best practices and behaviors, if you haven't done it before and you start to implement it, hang on. Fun's coming. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>